welcome to session number nine. We continue the story of women who lived with purpose. Now here's today's lesson. If you read the footnotes of American 20th century, you will find great tales of remarkable women and their achievements. If you only read the main text, you will miss most of these women. Our daily objective is I want you to choose three of the women that I speak about in this module and read more about them. Take yourself to school literally. Engage your curiosity about these women. Now, of course, this is the year that we celebrate the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. But first, I want to talk about your cell phone. There was a beautiful Austrian actress by the name of Hedwig Kiesler, whose stage name became Hedy Lamarr. Hedy Lamarr came from Austria just before World War II, and she moved over to Los Angeles. She had grown up in Vienna, a very curious and engaging young woman who would ask her father how things worked, how the trams worked, uh, how the various uh, electricity worked, and he would take patience to explain to her, and she was a brilliant student. She later was married to an arms merchant in Austria, and she sat at many dinners, appearing just to be that gorgeous piece of arm candy that she was, but she was in fact listening in on these conversations and understanding the terrible weapons about which these men were discussing. Now, as she came over to the United States, this was the time at which the British were sending their children to Canada or to Northern Ireland, places for them to be safe. And unfortunately, the German U-boats would attack these ships, knowing full well that they were full of British children. And they did so for the purpose of creating terror, and they did among the Brits. Now, when Hetty got to the United States, one of the things that nagged in her mind is, wouldn't it be possible to create a radio-driven torpedo that could avoid the mechanical shortcomings of other torpedoes and sink these U-boats. The problem was that torpedoes in those days were mechanical. Like an arrow, you aimed it in one direction and the wind, or in this case the water currents, would affect it, the distance, the movement of the target, the movement of the ship from which it had been launched. But if you could put radio guidance into the torpedo, you could deliver it and sink these German U-boats. She and her fellow inventor came up with an idea on how, in fact, you could swip, switch um, the sending and receiving frequencies. Now, if you had a frequency on which these radio-controlled things were uh, controlled, it'd be easy for the enemy to figure it out to block that frequency. So what she and her co-inventor did is they came up with a way to swap back and forth so they would vary the frequency on which the signal was given. It was a magnificent invention. And although the Navy did seize the invention, she was granted a patent. You can look up her patent. But they never implemented it, never used it. Later, when cell phone technology came into place, part of the problem was the same as it had been with those radio-guided torpedoes. How could you have more than a few, a few hundred, a few thousand senders and receivers, transmitters and receivers, operating on the same frequency? It wouldn't work. So the makers of the cell phone technology adopted essentially what's called spread spectrum, spectrum technology so that when you pick up your phone and you connect to a signal at the local uh, uh, tower, the signal is constantly changing. It's maximizing to find the best signal. So the reason that you have these remarkable gifts of smartphones that you do is thanks to the gorgeous Hedy Lamarr, who was a fine actress and who was promoted by MGM as the world's most beautiful woman. And I think they may have been right about that. 
at least in those times. Rebecca Lattimore Felton was sworn in as the first member of the United States Senate on November 21st, 1922. She was 87 years old. She served only one day when the Senate was in session. Hers was an appointment to fill the vacancy. She chose not to seek election and she died at age 95. Mae Jemison. Mae Jemison was a, is a remarkable young African-American woman from the south side of Chicago. Actually, she grew up in the same neighborhood where we lived for a long time, and she went to the same high school that my daughter would later go to. Mae Jemison was a gifted, gifted student who entered Stanford University as a freshman at age 16. She qualified eventually. She went to medical school. She qualified for the NASA Corps. She served on several space shuttle missions. And you can look her up. She's still a great advocate for women in the sciences. Speaking of women in the sciences, Sally Ride was the first American woman in space. Not the first woman, but the first American woman in space in 1983. And she was the youngest at the time, just 32 years old. She flew two more missions. She held a PhD in physics, also from Stanford University. Sadly, she died in the year 2012 at age 61. Sally Ride. Anne Dunwoody, another name you never heard of, was the first female four-star general in the U.S. Army. She retired after 38 years of service. She joined in 1974. So this is a relatively modern phenomenon. Anna Mae Hayes was the chief of the Army Nurse Corps. She was promoted to general officer in June of 1970 during the Vietnam War. She was the first woman in U.S. history in the Army to become a general officer. Now, speaking of general officers, Grace Murray Hopper was promoted to the rank of Rear Admiral. She retired. She tried to retire several times and she was called back into the service by the Navy. She held a PhD from Yale, and her special field was computer, computer software. She was actually one of the co-developers of the COBOL, C-O-B-O-L, language. She was 79 years and eight months old the last time the Navy forced her into involuntary retirement in 1986. If you want to read about one of the great pioneers in computer technology, read about Grace Murray Hopper. Now remember, this is not just a series of anecdotes. These are announcements to you of remarkable women who lived in America, who changed America during the 20th century, and you may not have heard of them. You may have heard, I suspect, of Dorothy Day. She was a great leader in Catholic social thought. On March 1st, 1933, she and her colleague Peter Morin, literally a French peasant, founded the Catholic Worker Movement in New York. She was a gifted writer, and she was a convert to Catholicism, and she gave rise to the Catholic Worker Movement. It was a time during the Depression when Americans were very desperate, and they were very desperate for social justice. And Gary Wills, uh, a significant Catholic in his own right, wrote about Dorothy Day in Esquire magazine in 1983. He wrote that by the end of the 1930s, the Catholic worker movement was the most vital force in the Catholic Church for change. Her example, my voice now, not Wills, gave several generations of activists the vision and the courage and the example to oppose war peacefully and to advocate for the poor forcefully. When I was a student here, I used to subscribe to the Catholic Worker magazine. It would come every week in my mailbox. I later had a chance to visit one of her coffee houses at the Bowery in New York. She was not there, but this is 1967. She was still alive. And then at later that year, I had a chance to visit her farm up in Tivoli, New York. And it was a very moving experience. I spent a week there in 
in formation, if you will, leadership development for the National Federation of Catholic College Students, of which I was involved at the time. Catherine Hepburn. Catherine Hepburn may be known to many of you as a great actress and a woman who holds many Academy Awards and more Academy Award nominations than any other actor in history. She was the daughter of a prominent physician and the daughter of a prominent suffragette. Her mother, Catherine Houghton, was a prominent suffragette. Hepburn always had this sense of never having been limited by her gender. She went to the finest school. She graduated from Bryn Mawr in Philadelphia, and she was a blue blood in every single way. But she would have none of that fanciness, none of that distance, none of that limitation put on women of her era. I've seen many of her films, and I recommend them to her. I had it to you. I had a chance to see her on stage in 1982 in a play called West Side Waltz. That was a thrill for me to see her in person. Um, I also had a chance to write her a letter because my wife and I were spending our wedding night in the same hotel, the White Hall, where Miss Hepburn was a guest. So I had this wonderful picture I bought at Larry Edmonds bookstore out in Los Angeles, and I wrote her a note on the stationery of the hotel. I said, Dear Miss Hepburn, my wife and I just spent our wedding night here. We really respect your work and admire your uh, persona and wonder if you would do us the favor of signing this photograph for us as a wedding gift. I dropped it off at the counter the next day, front desk. I came back the following day. There was an envelope for me. I held my breath. I pulled out the photograph. Again, it was an old publicity still from the 1930s and it wasn't signed. I knew that she was terribly peculiar about not signing photographs. But I looked in the envelope and there was a piece of her personal stationery. She had written Janet and me a letter. Dear John and Janet Sedek, I cannot sign that picture. It is too idiotic. And in fact, I do not sign photographs. But given the circumstances, let me take this opportunity to wish you all the joy that life can bring when you pass it with someone you love. Sincerely, Catherine Houghton Hepburn. <laughs> that was a pretty nice wedding present from one of the great women of the 20th century, Catherine Houghton Hepburn. We will, I hope, have some time to talk about the Women Air Force Service, the WASPs. <clears throat> During World War II, the United States had great need for pilots. Pilots to take ships from the factory to the bases where they would either be sent overseas or whether they would be deployed. Quickly, the United States ran out of male pilots as quick as they could. They had about 14,000 pilots in America who were female at the time, and they opened up this branch of service, this auxiliary service, to women. There were very high standards for these women and only about a thousand were eventually admitted into service. One of those was Margaret Ray Ringenberg, born 1921, died July 2008. Maggie Ray, as she was called, was not as famous as Katherine Hepburn or Dorothy Day. She was one of the only 1,074 pilots of Women's Air Force Service pilots, so-called WASPs. During operations, there were 38 of them who were killed stateside. They were disbanded in late 1944, and their records were classified and sealed. Americans, unless you were on the bases, didn't know about the women's Air Force service pilots. Eventually, their service was recognized by Congress, and some status as military was given to them. But they did not have rank, and they did not have pensions. It's a shame because these women contributed so much to the victory. Maggie Ray is another one I'm delighted to say I did meet. She stayed here in Atchison some years ago when my wife had a bed and breakfast. She was being honored by the Amelia Earhart people and so I had a chance to get to know her. My father was in fact assigned at the base, uh, Newcastle Air Base in Wilmington. And I asked her, I said, by any chance 
Did you ever meet a technical sergeant, Joe Sedick? She looked at me and she just smiled and said, women don't talk. <laughs> I just thought she probably didn't, but she was nice enough to keep that mystery going. My father had long since been deceased and I don't know if he ever met her, but he probably did because he was in operations there. Now I'll just take a second. I hope you know a little something about Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart was born here in Atchison, July 24th, 1897. Her parents went home, that is to the mother's family home, to be born here, for her to be born. And her mother's parents did not approve of her father. Her father was an attorney and a clerk and worked for the uh, railroad, but he was a drunk and they just didn't approve. And so they said, why don't you let the girl live with us? We can give her more advantages. So mom and dad actually lived in uh, Kansas City. They'd ride the commuter train often to see Amelia and have her back and forth to Kansas City, but she lived here for the first 11 years of her life. And then three years later in 1900, her sister Muriel was born. So there was a lot of Atchison in her. She developed a lot of her sense of adventure. Now, historically, the reason she's important is she was the first woman to fly across the Atlantic. In 1928, she was a passenger with a couple of men who piloted a plane. She handled herself so well that George Putnam, the publisher, who had published Lindbergh's book in 1927, said, that's my lady Lindy. I want her. She already had her pilot's license. On the on May 20th, 1932, five years to the day that Lindbergh had taken off, Amelia took off solo. No other person, male or female, had succeeded in the very dangerous solo flight across the Atlantic. So Amelia was taking a chance. She flew and she flew and she flew, and her sense of direction was flawed even then. She was aiming for Paris and Orly Field, just as Lindbergh had, she ended up landing, crash landing, in a surprise farmer's field in Northern Ireland, where they still celebrate her crash and her landing. She survived the landing, and she technically crossed the Atlantic, and she was a great heroine for it. She was celebrated. She had a lot to do with women and with aviation, and of course with our little town. Now, Jane Addams was the founder of the so-called Settlement House Movement. She was most famous for her work at the Hull House in Chicago. When I went to the University of Illinois Chicago for my doctoral degree, that Hull House is located on the campus of UIC. So I literally would park my car and walk past the Hull House, past that memorial to history to get to my classes. Jane Addams was the first American woman to receive the Nobel Peace Prize, and she received it in 1931. Hattie Wyatt Carraway was the first American woman elected in her own right to the U.S. Senate from Arkansas in 1932. She had been appointed to succeed her husband, but she was the first woman to win election and then to chair a committee and the first woman to preside over the Senate in 1943. Another woman about you, whom you should know is Shirley Chisholm. Shirley Chisholm was a remarkable African-American woman who was the first African-American woman to be elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. She served for 14 years. She was, at the Democratic, Democratic Convention, nominated for the presidency. She was eventually not nominated at that convention but she was the first woman so honored and seriously nominated. Madeleine Albright, you may remember, was the first woman to be Secretary of State, chosen in 1997. The highest position ever held by a woman in the United States government. Until, of course, Nancy Pelosi became Speaker of the House. Now here's a woman you haven't never heard about, I guarantee, Mary Campbell of Columbus, Ohio. She was selected as the first Miss America in 1922. 
and the only one to repeat her title in the following year. When she was elected, she was only 16 years old. I suppose it's a sad commentary throughout the 20th century that so many women would be famous exclusively or primarily for their beauty. Nancy Dickey was elected the first woman as the president of the American Medical Association. That happened in 1998. Now, the American Medical Association was founded in Philadelphia in 1847, 151 years before. It kind of took them a long time to find out the value of women in leadership. Roberta Cooper Ramo was elected the first female president of the American Bar Association in 1995. They were founded in 1878. They were a little more rapid than the American Medical Association, only took them 107 years. Marianne Hammer from Florida was the first woman elected as president of the National Rifle Association. The NRA took 124 years. Now, Hattie McDaniel. Hattie McDaniel was a very famous African-American actress during the 20th century. And unfortunately, most of the roles written were written for black actress, black maid, and she and Louise Beavers and a couple of others divided most of these roles in Hollywood. Except that Hattie McDaniel got a chance to play Mammy in Gone with the Wind in 1939. She was a magnificently powerful, strong counterbalance against the willful Scarlett O'Hara. And if you've seen the film, you know how important she was. She was nominated for an Academy Award and she received an Academy Award. It is great to watch her acceptance speech. Now the sad thing about those times was when they had the premiere of the film in Atlanta, <laughs> Hattie McDaniel was not allowed to go to the premiere. Clark Gable and other members of the cast said, we're not going if she can't go. And she said, no, this is Atlanta, this is Georgia, you go, I'll be all right. And she was, and of course received an Academy Award. It was just in late July of this summer that the last member of that famous cast had gone with the wind, Olivia de Havilland died. Now Mary Kay Ash, you may have heard of Mary Kay Cosmetics, she created this empire and it's a very successful, had been for many, many years. She founded as Direct Sales Cosmetics in 1963. It was not someone who took her name, she created this name and created this empire, this economic empire. Now, Jane Fonda, actress, writer, fitness guru, has had many incarnations during the 20th century, and she has become an important part of American 20th century. So there are American first ladies, of course. We mentioned Edith Galt last time, Eleanor Roosevelt, Nancy Reagan, Hillary Clinton, others a little less uh, public, Bess Truman, Pat Nixon, Lou Hoover, Herbert Hoover's. Now, when it rains this weekend and you turn on your windshield wipers, say thank you, Mary Anderson, because it was Mary Anderson, an American woman, who invented the windshield wiper. Now, I'm very grateful for <clears throat> the gifts of Hetty Lamar, but I also am in awe of what Ruth Wakefield did. Ruth Wakefield invented chocolate chip cookies in 1930. They were originally called Toll House Cookies. Patsy Sherman invented Scotchgard stain repellent in 1953. Stephanie Qualick was a research chemist at DuPont. She invented this liquid crystalline polymer fiber that eventually ended up being Kevlar, a product five times more stronger than steel and certainly had a lot to do with saving a lot of our soldiers in the battlefield since. Of course, Ruth Handler was the one who invented the Barbie doll in 1959, something that some of you may be familiar with. Temple Grandin is a woman who is alive. He was supposed to schedule 
speak on the campus a couple of years ago. We have not yet been successful in getting her. She is a PhD who's famous for her understanding of animals and how to handle animals humanely. Temple Grandin, remarkably, is on the autistic spectrum and somewhere between that autism and her normal abilities, she has this remarkable sensitivity to animals and their needs. I know that all of you are grateful, or will be someday, to Marion Donovan. She invented the disposable diapers in 1951. Now some of these inventions and some of these introductions by women were things that you probably would have suspected. Others, not. You probably didn't know that Grace Mary Hopper was the great developer of COBOL, that significant programming language, or that Hattie Lamar made your cell phone possible. What else, I wonder, is it that we do not know about American women in the 20th century or in these times? Please get curious and explore on your own.